गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी दिस इज संगीता सक्सेना एडिटर एविएशन एंड डिफेंस यूनिवर्स गेटिंग यू लाइव फ्रॉम ग्रेटर नोएडा एट द ए डब्ल्यू एच ओ गुरजिंदर विहार वी आर हियर मीटिंग अ मैन हु एवरी वन नोज फॉर्मर डी जी एम ओ फॉर्मर डी जी इन्फेंट्री एंड फॉर्मर कर्नल ऑफ द रेजिमेंट पैराशूट रेजिमेंट लेफ्टिनेंट जनरल विनोद भाटिया सो वेलकम टू एडियूज चैट रूम वंडरफुल टू हैव यू हियर ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ द सेवेंटी एथ इंडिपेंडेंस डे थैंक यू वेरी मच संगीता जी इट्स ऑल इज अ प्लेजर बींग ऑन योर प्लेटफॉर्म आई फील गुड से एनीथिंग ऑन योर प्लेटफॉर्म वॉट्स थैंक यू फॉर सो दैट्स वंडरफुल वी आर रियली प्रिवलेज and sir today i thought you know 78 years since independence and one person we would like to speak about is our soldier and i thought what better than you who's led such a big infantry been dgmo of such a big army and someone who knows the soldiers modernization efforts in and out so sir where do you see our soldier from 1947 sir but on the 78th independence day uh, our soldiers one thing i can say uh, the indian soldiers that also includes the sailor and air warriors uh, are the most combative in battle hard soldier anywhere in the world and since 1947 to 2024 78 years they have always delivered right from the first day onwards was 26th october 1947 onwards to the day they have never failed the nation they never fail the people and they always deliver and the indian soldiers uh, i must say they cost the minimum and deliver the maximum uh, having said that uh, i think uh, modernization is continuous constant process and that has to be seen in the light of uh, the threats which india has which are definite uh, which are totally if you say if you ask me uh, they are not only definite but they are detailed threats and we know the threats very well and most of the threats emanate from the sea level uh, to siachen from absolutely uh, from uh, minus 50 degree centigrade to plus 50 degree centigrade and a set is a soldier and uh, we have to keep modernizing the soldier's weapon and equipment make sure that he is light he is agile he is fit and he can deliver uh, the weaponry at the right time at the right place when required so uh, basically if you look at a soldier from head to heel he needs literally a uh, hundred things of equipment uh, it's not so easy everyone thinks that he only needs a rifle nothing else but no from head to heel hundred odd things go into equipping and kitting a soldier to be effective and over the years uh, enough modernization has taken place but that does not mean that optimal has been done more needs to be done especially in terms of uh, the weight on the soldier which, which some people call the burden on the soldier but the soldier's body weight uh let's take an average body weight about 65 kg and the average weight he carries into battle his battle load is being about 25 to 30 kg so that's what half his uh, uh, body weight of every soldier i'm talking about so this is something which uh, we have been constantly endeavoring to do is to reduce uh, the soldier's uh, weight uh, be it his weight of the weapon be it the weight of the equipment his helmet his body armor uh, his ammunition Uh, making him more agile, uh, more lean, more mean. So that is where I think soldier modernization uh, is a constant process, and uh, we have not really failed the soldier. But to say that we have succeeded in giving everything, that also be incorrect. Much needs to be done. Much has been done. Uh, yes, sir. But uh, at the end of the day, the soldier gets modernized with equipment. Yes, but also that we need to train him. and training is a very important part of soldier modernization what would you like to say about it so what type of training do you think is there and what is lacking you know, uh, so i i would say training is lacking uh, what lacks in training is of one is the training equipment and two is the training time so that is what is lacking because the training time because of our deployment uh, are many tasks multiple tasks which we have to do the training time is very limited uh, most of the time we find our soldiers Uh, are moving from one place to another, one operation deployment to another operation deployment. So training time and training uh, costs and training equipment are very important actually, and uh, we need to spend more on training. And uh, when we talk about non-field force uh, equipment, and that is the equipment we go to first come in. The soldier needs to get familiar with the equipment, and they need to the in, uh, equipment has to be inducted, trained, and then exploited. We don't exploit the equipment in life cycle fully. 
So that is where I think uh, the training time is very important and all soldiers, uh, you know, they are very recruitment. The technology is changing so fast today and uh, I am talking of not only high tech equipment, even medium to low tech technology equipment also. The soldier has to get used to it and for that he needs time and he needs knowledge, skill and more importantly the time to exploit that equipment, the, the, what I call the attitude to exploit it. So that is something which has to be ingrained into our soldiers. All right, sir. And uh, is there any other concept of modernization, sir, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, a language? Everybody feels that the soldier's language, soldier's adaptability to languages of the, uh, you know, opponents and our uh, enemies is, has to be very strong. Is that something which you agree with, sir? Yes, I think uh, we have to, uh, no, uh, we have to have... Soldiers who are familiar with the culture uh, and the language, the lingua franca of the adversaries. That is very important. And things are moving in that direction when we get, especially when we are posted to the uh, various uh, operation deployment. We have the core battle schools, with the dip battle schools, uh, where a short capsule of about six to eight weeks is given to a unit, to a subunit, and then recurring capsules are carried out uh, for our soldiers uh, who are put through cycles of. Uh, no, uh, not only knowing the, uh, this thing, or knowing, knowing the enemy as they say is very important. That's not only now, knowing the enemy is always very, very important. Know yourself is fine, but know the enemy, you know, you can fight, win a hundred battles. And uh, that is where we put them to the CPS and the, uh, that is the core battle schools, the dip battle schools uh, and the training institutions. But I think more needs to be done, much more needs to be done. Unfortunately, I find, and uh, I may be wrong totally, uh, a lot of stress being laid on Chinese language. I would prefer stress on Tibetan language rather than Chinese language. Because, you know, uh, given our 3 4 rated criminal long border with Tibet, the people are mostly Tibetans there and, uh, you know, uh, we can hope and, uh, you know, rightly expect them to be a little more, you know, uh, anti-China and pro-India. So, Tibetan language is also very important. Learn learn this thing. Whereas, uh, with the Pakistan is concerned, uh, I think uh, language is not much of a problem because most of the time you see our troops are from that area only with the Rajasthan, whether they are Punjab or Jammu and Kashmir, uh, even Himachal for that matter, Uttarakhand also. Uh, so, they get the language very fast. Uh, but then again, there is a cultural difference between the two. And now we got Bangladesh also. So, we will have to look at, uh, uh, you know, the affinity which we have with the border states and that is how we are going into the sons of the Swal concept. We have the Arunachal Scouts, we have the Sikkim Scouts, we have the Ladakh Scouts, you know, the Kumau Scouts, the Garhwal Scouts. So, this has to be, you know, uh, more and more sons of the Swal concept has to come in uh, for border, border guarding duties. Right, sir. And, sir, when we talk of modernization, the exercises with friendly foreign countries has become the absolute mandate of the day. How does it help to modernize our soldier? No, well, I think uh, exercising, uh, carrying out combined exercises uh, with friendly foreign countries, uh, we imbibe and exchange the best practices. You know, there's a lot to learn and a lot to give. And when this, uh, when we joint do this combined exercise, normally people call it joint exercise, I call it combined exercise. Because joint, joint would mean integration between the three services. So the right word would be combined exercises. When we do combined exercises, we learn not only the best practices, we develop a sense of confidence and it gives an interoperability. Uh, we see each other's equipment, we see what is better out there, the, we learn the tactics, we learn the uh, sort of, a, you know, we do uh, some uh, uh, board exercises and uh, there's some scenario building exercises, uh, staff exercises. So there's a lot to learn from the combined exercise and we're doing it. This is also part of defense diplomacy. Uh, tomorrow, uh, it's an interconnected world, it's a network world. Mm -hmm. We never know who we'll have to operate with, uh, whether it's HRDR missions or other missions and even mm -hmm. uh, counter-terrorist operations. Uh, we could be operating together. So, I think it's a very good thing that we are carrying out now combined exercises. I'm not uh, very sure about the numbers, but it's over 40 countries that we are doing combined exercises with. 40 Army, Air Force and Navy. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest exercises taking place right now uh, uh, the Air Force and uh, look at the uh, look at the good press we are getting yeah. and the, they are so appreciative of our not only equipment of our tactics of our professional standard of our professional competence and that is where I think the confidence comes in uh, both uh, with each other and in ourselves so uh, the armed forces are very good.
Yes, absolutely, sir. I agree with you. That's that's one point where I think all Indians, we agree with it. And of course, our forces are the best in the world. I think we really have to agree with this point. But we've got to keep it the best. Yes, absolutely. And there's absolutely. a lot of effort required to do that. And so, so for this effort, is there a wish list we should have for the soldiers? Or we already have one for the soldiers, which still needs to be fulfilled, sir? Yeah, like I said, it's a continuous process. Yes, we have a wish list. We have a LTIPP long-term perspective plan, integrated perspective plan, uh, and uh, we need to more integration. We'll, we'll have to do some resource management. Our budget is limited and it, it has to be limited. There are you know, priorities at national level uh, which have to be met and defense cannot, you know, we can uh, ask for everything but we'll not get everything and we've got to understand that. So the optimal utilization of the defense budget, uh, especially our uh, capital budget and even our revenue budget for that matter, uh, becomes a key challenge. And uh, that is where I think the challenge would lie, uh, how to optimize it and what should the priority mean getting something. So we should look at life cycle costs and we should look at being Atmanir, but that is very important. I think when you talk about strategic autonomy uh, and India has gone public over it, you know, and uh, that's a very good thing. Mm. Uh, even if you look at it, about 60-65% of equipment is of Soviet origin or Russian origin. Uh, even last year, 36% of our uh, imports came from Russia. Uh, but we are expanding, uh, things are coming from uh, France, from UK, from US, from Israel and from other sources, South, South Africa, yeah. from even uh, other sources. So we are uh, diversifying and what best is happening is that Make in India, the Aknirvata and Defence, the two corridors which are happening, the ITEX is, is there. So it is going to take time, we started exporting, last year we exported about 21,000 crore worth of government. So things are moving, we have become one of the, in the top 20 exporters, we are always, you know, though we are net importer, fine, but we also want the top 24, 20 exporters. So things are moving in the right direction, we've got to give it time and we should have a, you know, a, a near to midterm plan to become partner. But that is exceedingly important and that's what is happening. So, but somewhere down the line, I mean, it's just a thought, probably it could be wrong, that we have these positive indigenization lists which have come out from the Raksha Mantri's office. Very good idea. But at the end of the day, sir, does it uh, lessen the supply chain uh, for you? Does it, at the end of the day, lessen the process and procedure and time, uh, increases the time for uh, end product? Because suddenly you got things which were coming from abroad. Now if those five lists forbid you to buy them. So by the time you get down, by the time the PSUs and the private sector, if uh, involved, will produce them. So the time lag then becomes very long. Is that true or do you think uh, uh, that's not true? No, you, you're absolutely right. It, it is true. We got the fifth list, list which come out of 98 items now. So uh, we have a positive indigenous list, but we also have to understand uh, that the armed forces have to be present relevant, present operationally prepared and future ready also. So present relevant, future ready. So th this transition which is happening, uh, uh, it, it does, uh, you know, it does impact uh, uh, our operational preparedness, our operational readiness to some extent. Uh, but then we have ways and means of coming over it. We have some reserves, so that is uh, going to happen. Uh, but I think if we look at the midterm, near to midterm, we'll have to indigenize. Uh, we are the largest, uh, you know, voluntary army in the world. Mm. We are the second largest army in the world. Yes. We are the fourth largest air force in the world, the fourth largest navy in the world. And we cannot do banking uh, for a military hardware uh, from other nations. And if we have to look at our, uh, let's say, when I say our threats which are definite, we are not our capability based alone. We are also threat based uh, with both uh, China and Pakistan and internal security situation. We are not two and a half fronts, we are looking at three, three fronts actually now. And that is what I, we have to see how to optimize it and how to have a transition management plan in place. We also have to understand that 80% of our military hardware is low to medium technologies. You know, when you talk of high technology, it's very easy, very good to talk of high technology, you know, the critical technology we call it. But 80% of equipment is low to medium technologies. And that is where I think our focus should be in soldier modernization. Uh, where it is bulk required, you know, when we have, when we talk of uh, uh, 1.3 uh, million armed forces, each soldier has to be equipped out there and that has to be indigenized. Yes, go ahead, critical technology, we should, we should be very, you know, uh, very sure that we need the technology and we should not shy away from importing the technologies. Mm -hmm. 
And so what happens when, uh, you know, when here we are talking to a DG infantry, but uh, at the end of the day, sir, uh, there are soldiers from all different corps whose requirement technically when it comes to modernization may be different. So you have a sapper, his requirement will be different. You have somebody from signals, his requirement will be different. RT, armor, just name them, any corps. So uh, is there a government, uh, you know, policy on how much to give to whom when it comes to modernization of the soldier? You know, we have iterations with them. We, we sit together. It's not that, you know, we have the deputy chief uh, who uh, is, uh, uh, who actually heads uh, all the heads of the arms and services. <laughs> so all the heads of the arms and services come under the deputy chief and that is where we sit together and then we resolve issues. There are certain things which are, the, the soldiers, what the maximum soldiers want is given to the DG infantry because 38% mm -hmm. of yeah. your uh, force levels is infantry. Mm -hmm. So that is common to everyone, like weapons are common to everyone, equipment is common to everyone, your combat equipment is common to everyone. But what is service specific, mm -hmm. that the head of the service, head of the arm, uh, that will decide in, con in concert. He, he heads that and he synthesizes the whole thing. He gets everyone together. So I think the process is uh, very good. Unfortunately, the process is a little slow and uh, we get a little impatient. We got to invest more in R&D, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's public-private or it's public mm -hmm. only. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to invest more in R&D. And when we invest in R&D, we should not look at immediate returns. Because immediate returns are not going to come. Mm -hmm. So that is where I think challenge lies to give R&D a free hand and let them fail because from failure you learn more. Actually, from success you learn less. Mm -hmm. So even if they fail, it doesn't really matter. So we look at failure as you know, it does not come out fail. So what? Failures also give us certain strengths. So we should trust our R&D, invest more in R&D, and make sure that we indigenize and come out with Indian equipment required to in, you know required for the Indian conditions. Now, our conditions are totally different. A lot of, a lot of people talk about UAVs now. You know, they, it's very good to talk about UAVs. UAV, well, in the market, most of the mm -hmm. Chinese UAV is very cheap. Mm -hmm. But will these UAVs, UAVs actually function in operational areas? If you look at wind speeds out there in the valleys, the winds are 40 knots. Well, yeah. Very few UAVs have the strength to, you know, people say, you go, you go a tailwind, you go in, but it has to retrieve. So you don't retrieve, what will happen? Mm -hmm. And where the power packs, uh, you don't get power packs of high meter and above. In Delhi, I go to a number of discussions, they said, you know, technology is the answer. Yes, technology is the answer. But do we have power packs which operate at 5,000 meters or 4,500 meters? Mm -hmm. I, I really don't know. Very true. I think you are very correct. And uh, sir, when we talk of soldier modernization, uh, we cannot alienate uh, one word from it. It might not be a part of modernization, but it is a part of morale boosting the HR policies for the soldier. So uh, do you think something needs to get modernized? Are we still sticking to the old age old HR policies? No, when you talk HR policies, I think that they have undergone a change. Uh, but have they, you know, have they kept pace with the change? The society is changing today. Uh, you know, the aspirations of the soldiers also have changed because they're, they're part of the society. So the aspirations also change. You know, everyone, it's an instant uh, sort of a, uh, you know, requirement. Everyone wants everything today, right now. Yes, so that, that sort of a thing is really not happening. We have to look at the soldier. We have to look at the HR policies. We have to look at the look, look at the aspirations, and we have to find. We have to get, uh, you know a congress between the aspiration of soldiers and the organizational needs. Mm -hmm. So if you get a congress between the two, that will be a win-win situation. And that is where I think the HR policies uh, have to have to come into this thing. And uh, let me say that uh, a lot needs to be done there. Uh, we, we are paying attention, definitely. Uh, all leaders, and I don't call them commanders, all leaders seek with this problem. Uh, a changing society, a changing societal norms, mm -hmm. a changing belief. Mm -hmm. uh, today, Unfortunately, the social media has become so strong that our, uh, our soldiers get to know things from the social media which they believe in. They are simple soldiers actually. So they believe everything that is thrown on them. And that is where I think our, uh, our value system is changing, our beliefs are changing and we need to sensitize our soldiers that look, this is what it is. And uh, maybe I think this time to get professionals like you to start a, you know, a 4G channel. Uh, it's, it's an idea which has been long mm -hmm. been there. So let's put it into a pack, let's start an armed forces channel or army channel and get professionals, uh, you know, uh, media professionals uh, who are influencers uh, to start such a thing and uh, let the army take a lead. But let not, not the arms not do it themselves because we do not have the 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, the thought, the training, the wave with all. So let the professionals do it. It's just mm-hmm. a thought. Right, sir. That is wonderful. Actually, it's such a lovely subject that, you know, it becomes unending at times and you really feel that so much to know. But I'm sure, sir, uh, I mean, all that you've said really makes a difference. The audience will be really happy to listen to it and hear and, you know, get to know the latest. Because at the end of the day, it is the soldier who is the man at the center of attraction, sinusure of all eyes. And I think it is because of him that we have the forces. So thank you so much, sir, to talking to us about him. And I think I'm sure when next time when we meet and talk, you will have much more. There will be more policies. There will be more to talk about. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And always great to connect to you.